Okay, we're going to start our sec or our next segment of uh, managing a herd through a long-term drought. I'd like to introduce Dr. Craig Gifford. Dr. Craig Gifford is the Extension Beef Cattle Specialist. Started in employment with the Extension. Huh? You can do the short version. <laughs> He's uh, the Extension Animal Science Natural Resources Department at the New Mexico State University. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Bronson, and appreciate you cutting that one off. I don't know where that one in or that introduction came from, but we got to get a different one on, on there for sure. <laughs> it's long. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation for coming out or for having me out today. I always enjoy getting up here for the uh, Cattlemen's College uh, and talk about, you know, uh, a tough act to follow and, and actually kind of is a sedge way into sort of this next thing and, and I'm not a big meme person but I actually found this one thought it was kind of funny it was I have family up north still in the livestock industry and on top you got the US ranchers if you didn't know the last year or so they were in a pretty big drought and they're talking about drought challenges and our New Mexico ranchers are saying a first time huh and I think that's we're, we're in one of the regions where we have some of the best uh, I'd say some of the best ranches at adapting to drought so that makes this this uh, this talk a little bit challenging because I don't know what I'm going to tell you in, in in some sense that you know you guys are really the experts. So we're going to talk today a little bit about you know the standard academic th uh, side from uh, herd reduction, early weaning, that thing, and then I hope to maybe talk a little bit about as I've surveyed some of the larger ranches in the region. And, and kind of pick their brain on this topic. And, and Dr. Clay Mathis, of course, over at the King Ranch Institute, he has a lot of experience over here. And, and sort of this transitioning from uh, this year-to-year -year management adaptation to maybe some long-term planning uh, opportunities or, or, or challenges that we might have. <laughs> so the one thing is I, I, I had to laugh when, when we look up the definition for long-term drought. It obviously wasn't somebody from the Southwest that, that made this definition, but it's drought that lasts over six months. And, and this, uh, this shows, I think this is over the last 20 years, this is the temperature increase, and I'm sure you saw this uh, a common theme throughout today's, today's presentations, but again, that the, the temperatures definitely have been, we've been in this pretty warm period, and, I, and I'll, I'll build on that in a, in a little bit. Uh, what this shows again, and, and I'm sure you saw this, that the percent of land that's been, land area that's been in a drought over that, that period of time, anywhere from abnormally dry up to exceptional drought. And he, he, you can see that the majority of our land area in the Southwest has, has done or been in what we define as drought. And I think that the thing is, if, if this isn't a drought, and, and this is something that gets to be more and more consistent, then we talk about herd management strategies with, with sort of that mindset. Because if it's even, even this long-term drought, something uh, drought within six months, if you think about a year cycle with, the, with cattle production, that's still a year-to-year -year adaptation. But if we're in a 20 or 30 year period or longer, then I think that changes things. And as, as I talked to several ranchers, we heard here on the panel just a few moments ago, this adaptation to drought is, is, is changing. And our definition of long-term drought is quite a bit different, I think, down here than, than other parts of the world, okay? <clears throat> so the other thing, and, and I, again, talked talk with a lot of folks about this, this discussion, but the bottom line is this, when there's no forage, there's, there's not a lot of options. And, and I think that's the first reality that we have to, that we work with, and, and I'm sure you're all well, well aware of that. But as Clay Mathis says, there's, there's no magic bullets, okay? There's nothing, when there's no grass, there's no grass. Uh, but the, the key to the operations is in, in, in moving forward, and he's, they're talking about this at the King Ranch Institute with a lot of their ranch managers now, especially those that are coming out to West Texas and this part of the world, is it's flexibility and resilience within that operation. And how do you build that uh, within your herd structure? And so we'll, we'll talk about some of the examples uh, going forward, but it's, it is, it's this center things on, on things that matter and things you can control. And it's that overlap on, on what you can really do, okay? 
So these are just some of the options and I'm sure we, we heard through the panel and we've heard uh, throughout the day, what, what can you do? And, and I think the, the key is these are all things that we do assuming within one year we're gonna be in a drought and we're trying to get through that year. But um, as, we've, as we've probably learned this past 20 years, that we're really transitioning to these more long-term strategies. And we've heard, we just heard this rancher panel discuss that. So, and, and I'm sure Dr. Spackman talked about this. I'm just gonna throw a couple scenarios out there first. And, and the thing is, is how much forage do you have? And, and we went through that um, I'm on the range monitoring. And the, uh, Tom was just talking about his clip and weigh method. Uh, the thing I'd encourage you is make sure and, uh, you know, select those representative sites. But I'm going to get through that part more quickly because we want to talk about grazable acres here in just a second. So this is what 2,600 pounds of uh, forage looks like per acre. It's roughly that. This is what 1,200 pounds an acre looks like. This is what 200 pounds an acre looks like. And, and so when you do these clippings, let's say if we're on, on May 8th and you have an average of 300 pounds an acre in this 2,600 acre pasture, which is relatively small, 2,000 acres of it are actually accessible to cows. I want you to keep this in the back of your mind because we're going we're gonna to revisit this thought later. But for this discussion, just it's important to estimate you can't apply it across the whole entire pasture if the cows can't access it. All right? So we're, I'm more on the physiology side, so Casey will probably correct me. But we're going to say that you need to leave at least 250 pounds per acre of forage uh, the rest is getting, and that's for trampling, insects, and just, just sufficient ground cover. <clears throat> so that means you have about 50 pounds per acre after you did your clipping. If you have 100 cows, uh, that means on 2,000 acres, you have 100,000 total pounds of forage at the moment. If they eat 25 pounds a day, that means you have 40 days of grazing. That's how it works out. On May 8th, if you grow no more forage, you have 40 days, all right? So when we talk about herd management from, from a drought perspective, it's really important that you establish this type of baseline first. Because if you don't know this, you can't really adapt the herd to, to meet, meet your range requirements. Does that make sense? And I think Tom really, really highlighted that really well on the last talk. This is the, this is the first step to, to herd management is you're either, and hopefully this is before you enter the drought or if you're, if you're in it. So the option one is do nothing. At that point, you're just hoping, you're hoping like heck that it rains and that, that, that you have or, your, or that grass seed or that grass bank is going to be able to respond to whatever precipitation you have. So that's option one. All right. Option two is you sell half your herd. So you go in and your herd management strategy is I'm going to cull half of them. All right. Now you have 80 days. All right. We're May 8th. So you're assuming then it's going to rain by August. All right. So that's your second option. And, and so the real risk here is that there's no rain and no stock adjustment. It's a risk to your long-term long -term health of that ranch. And um, it's a risk to your cattle performance because as things do start coming back after you ha hammer it, that's when things like reproduction or some of your traits, we'll talk about that, poisonous plants, your weaning weights. Uh, if you do decide to sell at some point, you start getting cut for those shelly cows at the sale. Uh, and then of course you get, you get some re you know, other revenue losses if they actually die. So that's, that's start, starting point number one. Is this a situation you are in or have you already adjusted so you have hopefully more than this 40 days, uh, 40 days to adjust? So the other thing I wanted to, to bring up during drought, and we overlook this a lot, and, and I think this is sort of something the academic side needs, needs to do a little more work on, but if you assume a cow requires about 25 or 24 pounds of dry matter, um, and you do the math on this, if there's 88% dry matter, that means that, that forage is really dry. In a drought situation, it's gonna be even drier. Um, that's about three, 
basically three pounds or half a gallon of water. Um, and if cows that are grazing really green forage, they can obtain up to eight gallons of water from that forage. Okay, so you might ask, well, why is that even important? And if, if you think about where your water locations are at within a pasture, and then if it's a really green or a really lush environment, we have some data that supports this, that those cows are able to tra travel around in pasture utilizations better. Does that make sense? And so if you make your assumptions on how much forage you have, and you have you, you assume 100% pasture utilization in a drought, as that forage continues to dry out, we have data that, sh that shows the cow's ability to move away from that water source is decreased. All right now we have pasture situations where we don't we can't utilize 100 percent even though that might be what we're calculating in for and that's one of the traps of a drought it's a double-edged sword those cows can't travel out as much as as they could so your pasture utilization may may suffer from that because they're just not getting this uh, uh, this eight gallons a day the other side of that is if you have pretty bad water now now it's another edge to the sword because they're having to drink more of that bad water and that's where you're going to see more more production problems associated with that okay all right this is one that we we hear a lot about and we see it and you'll see it in every academic publication around but i think it's important to keep a little bit of uh, of of reality associated with this they say well yeah if you're in a drought just early wean and and that is a strategy it's a band-aid strategy um it's it's not generally economical but it can extend the pasture so a general rule of thumb if you're evaluating this as one of your herd management is you get about two and a half days uh, that every two and a half days that the calf is removed from the female you can get one more day of grazing for her and that's just a general rule of thumb but let's put that into like a, a into a table situation so Let's say if the number of cows, that, or calves, excuse me, that we need to early wean, and by early, I'm gonna say either 30 or 60 days early, uh, to run one cow for six months, you'd have to wean, early wean 15 calves, and then of course double if you, if you wanna uh, early wean, you can double that by doing, or reduce that by half, excuse me, if you uh, wean them 60 days early, all right? So if you distill all this down, for every 100 calves that you wean 60 days early, you save enough forage for about six or seven cows for one year. All right, that's what that's what early weaning will do for uh, in in a 60 day situation. Okay, so as you can see, it it is a band aid and it does help, but that's not a long term strategy to to address this to address the drought. I'm not telling you don't do it, but just understand you're not gaining enough to run that herd for for an entire year. You're just you're gonna get, you're gonna be able to gain a few months or a month or two, but you're not gonna gain a whole year round management situation. All right. Um, when we do talk about coaling, that's that's obviously the first response to a drought or hopefully ahead of a drought. Um, or if things start drying out and forage becomes a little bit limited. Um, you know, the, about the best thing that I could come up with is, is we, as I talk to a lot of these ranch managers and then you look through the literature, the first thing is, and, and this is something that, uh, you know, is often overlooked, if you get a chance and you have to make a decision to start colon pregnant cows, it's worth it to have someone come out and stage them. All right, because you, you want to, you know, if you're going to cut your herd by half, you can at least have that opportunity to tighten the calving window a little bit and, and try to get the cows that are going to calve earlier in that calving season and, and not spread out. So rather than just randomly pick cows that you're going to cull, that's one strategy that some of these bigger ranchers would do is they'd come in, stage those pregnancies, and then they'd try to keep those groups together. The other thing that helps with is after they calve that you can target your supplementation strategy a little easier for those cows because they're all at the same stage of or similar stages of parturition, lactation, and, and subsequently breeding. So it is, I'm not going to say there's opportunity in drought, but that's one to not or to, to think about, uh, especially 
Uh, in, in a drought situation, we often think about protein, but energy is one of the biggest limiting things there, there are or limiting feedstuffs in drought. Your older cows, uh, older seven, older than seven or eight, are generally in combination with your young cows, those twos and threes. They have the greatest energy demands, okay? And, and those groups make sense to also go up the coal list as you're making that decision for your herd, your herd composition. Um, you'll, you'll see this in, in publications that you can wean these heifers and they don't, they don't eat as much so you can kind of build the herd back. But the reality in this region is, especially in a multi-year drought, even if you get them pregnant, say that next spring, it's a whole nother year before they have a calf and you have any revenue, and then you're up into this two and three group where they're gonna take more energy at that point. Um, so in general, your middle-aged cows are gonna be your toughest cows and, and probably the most resilient to the drought, okay? Um, of course, defects, poor doers, anything you can think of the, uh, to, to elevate those animals up the coal list, and if they're having poor calves, uh, that, that obviously makes them up a pretty big criteria to, to get rid of. And, and that's sort of the immediate management side of things. Um, and, and I'd say that the other is to use your past experiences to determine your likely production losses. And we're going to get into records here in a second, but um, <coughs> this is... Uh, this is a big thing in, in terms of how you can adapt to this. If you haven't been keeping records, and, and again, we'll talk about that, it's a good time to do that because you want to start to build this plan for the future, how these past experiences, where are your losses at, and then you can start to calculate, all right, here's where the feed prices are at, here's where my losses are at, here's what it's going to cost me to fill that gap. Is it worth it or is it not worth it? Because sometimes it's not. And in some cases, I don't know, what did, what did some eight weights here the other day I saw sell for like $1,400 a head or $1,500 a head or something? You can afford to put a little feed in, the, in, in them in that, that scenario. When they're bringing 1000 a head, it's a little cha more challenging. And then you want to keep track. One thing that, you know, do regional drought responses pose a risk? We, we haven't really studied this, but in conversations, with, again, with some of these other ranches, it was at the ELAP program that paid the mileage on, on some of this hay. Now all of a sudden we started moving hay from all over different places, was going everywhere, and that put stresses on the, on the hay reserves in given areas that normally there might be hay in that region because it costs too much to truck it out of there. But when you have a program that's, that's supplementing the mileage, all of a sudden hay is again moving all over the western U.S. Okay, because I think that program paid uh, what up 60 cents a mile or 60% of the cost up to a thousand miles or something. So, uh, you know, those are evolving things that you have to kind of keep an, keep an eye on. And so you might say that, say this, right? We've been there, done that, and it's time to, to adapt. Or, so these are sort of ones that you don't see in the publications as often. These are things that, that came out of, uh, of more, more of the interview process. And it's major. And, and one, of the, one of the things, and I, and I say this all the time, that I really enjoy about my job is that I get to kind of tool around with some really experienced ranchers. And I can tell you in this region, we have some of the best at adapting. And uh, this one old rancher that I actually went around with, I didn't get his permission to use his name, so I'm not going to say it. But he, he had been on that ranch long enough to know his rule of thumb was it was one, his stocking rate was for every inch of precipitation, he could run a cow per section. So if he had 10 inches, he could run 10 cows a section. And, and he just knew and he had that down. But that was over years of keeping the adequate measure. And, and I don't know how he did it, but that it, his ranch looked fantastic. And, and he only had five inches of rain the previous year. So his, his ranch was in great shape. And he just, it, but it was through measurement. Uh, standard, you know, try to standardize the terms, definitions, and things as much as you can. Re uh, measure what's relevant. And then we'll get into this. Uh, flexibility. See, is, is also the key to this, um, and that's developing a marketing plan. We'll talk about some measurements here in just a second, drought specific, but this is also one of the things that a lot of the uh, 
a lot of adaptation strategies have evolved from a herd perspective is we kind of get in a mindset of we're always cow-calf, always cow-calf, and, and that's good, but um, you want to think about some options to retain ownership in some cases. Are you better off with, uh, with fewer cows? And if you have the forage retaining ownership, if you don't, don't retain the ownership. And then you keep that base cow herd, you know, a lot smaller. Uh, and then the other thing is make sure you have enough information to forward contract calves. Uh, do what they pay you to do. But what I want to get into mostly is these drought measurements. And it goes back to that concept of one inch per one section thing but you want to start to monitor these things like precipitation events we, we think a lot in the box of how often or excuse me how much it rains but sometimes it matters when it rains and uh, you want to look at your production traits during a drought your overall pa pasture utilization trends and then start to build these long-term plans and key indicators based on that ranch level data. And I think that was one of the things as we talked to all or talked to a lot of these ranches, they all had a ranch level management plan. And they all had data on forage production and precipitation events. All of them had that information at their fingertips. And they tracked that over several years so they know they need X amount of rain by Y date. Otherwise, they need to start pulling the trigger. And, and I think that that was one of the things that I really picked up on as a difference between some of these that have adapted and been around for a long time was that record keeping process relative to drought. And, and that database really helped them drive their decisions on, on their herd management. All right, and, and this is back to that herd composition thing. So traditionally, we're cow-calf. Um, so, you know, do you, do you stay that way? And, and in some cases that makes sense. Do you stay that way and then just continue to fluctuate the number of cows you run? Or can you, you know, does it make sense? And, and it probably depends on herd size and how you're marketing. But can you sustain that smaller, uh, that smaller herd size and then use that extra grass if you happen to get it and use it either through retained ownership uh, buying stalkers or other things to adapt to that? Is that something to, to consider? And uh, the specific one ranch we looked at runs, I think, 600 head. They did reduce that down to about 300, and then they used that extra 100 or 200 head, excuse me. Uh, they used that to run either stalkers or not, is kind of how their, their adaptation, but they keep it, they've reduced their cow herd down that much, and then they use that grass bank if, if they're fortunate enough to get rain. They use that extra get grass bank as they see fit, but it provides them with a little bit of flexibility in combination with forward contracting. They're, they, they were actually able to pigeonhole, uh, you know, where they're going to stand within most drought years. And that was a pretty good, I thought that was an interesting approach to that. And then as, as, I, as we get close to wrapping this up, I don't know uh, if you've seen this. I'm sure it was discussed a little earlier. I, I walked in a little bit late. This came out in March. I, you know, I don't know if I'm smart enough to, uh, to, to go through all of this, but uh, the red line basically shows the last uh, 20 years from 2000 to two, 2021. If you read this paper, basically the conclusion is this is the driest 20-year period since 800 A.D., and uh, um, and that includes this, and and so that's what struck me as I read through that, and we think back to what we saw in the 30s, and again one of the ranches, uh, this was a different one, and again I didn't ask this gentleman's name, he he had also been around a really long time, and I was I was picking his brain about this, and asked him, you know, is this the driest you've ever seen? And he said, oh, he said, I'm not sure if it's the driest we've ever been. He said, maybe the 50s were worse, but he said, we sure have better tools now. And I think that as, as we sort of adapt and, and, and look forward, I think it's important to, one, utilize those tools that we're going to have, a, that we currently have available, but some of these emerging tools that are coming out uh, to not ignore. And, and I think Tom was talking about some of his grazing strategies and this, I, I think the catch terms regenerative ag now, uh, but there's also new technology like water monitoring, water delivery systems, uh, and, and 
Also, we can, I think we can do better jobs of identifying exactly where some of these moisture sinks are. And, and the thing, and, and this isn't for, for the ranching crowd, this is maybe for those that, I don't know, in policy or anything, ranching's been adapting for a long time. And I think if we give ranchers the right tools and the right information and, and the stuff that, that they already know and let them adapt through things like brush control is a great example of that. So I'm going to end with, uh, we get a lot of questions about this, but fence is what, 10,000 bucks a mile right now. And as we look at these new, uh, these new strategies, or not strategies, but if we're looking at pasture utilization, water development sources, I think those are all technologies that are going to have to adapt. Some of this virtual fe fencing situation, and I'm not going to belabor that, but basically they put a collar on these cows. I'm going to admit, I was one of the biggest skeptics of this until I started kind of working with it. Uh, and and as, you, as you watch these animals sort of respond, and then you see what like Oregon State's been using these in really extensive pasture situations. I, my mind's slowly changing, I'm not there yet. But basically what this shows, if I can, this shows their training pattern. So these are three different feed sources. And then you can see this yellow line right here. At first, when the virtual fence is off, this is the training situation. We'll ignore all of this, but you can see that the cows have full access to the three uh, feeding stations. Once they initiate that virtual fence, this is part of the training side, you can see that even with that bale of hay over there, they're able to start restricting those cows. And then when they actually put them on, out on a pasture, this is pasture distribution with no virtual fence. And then you can see the yellow line shown here. This is once that virtual fence is initiated here, here, and then here. And the green actually shows where the cows were located. So I, I guess this, the, the moral of this or the long story short is I'm not telling you to run out by virtual fence but I'm telling you to stay maybe staying abreast of some of this stuff that these might be opportunities in the future if we start thinking hey we got to divide these pastures up a little more we can develop water sources a little more but we just can't get the cows to it these are these are the types of things we might be able to use in the future uh, to adapt to these and and, and I'm sure there's going to be a gazillion more coming out but this is just one example so, you know, if this, if this continues for the next however long, adapting the ranch will take on a year, a new meaning. There's this year-to-year -year management practices, those are still important. Culling, early weaning, supplementing, feeding, all the stuff we've, we've known. But, you know, these longer-term strategies are going to be necessary. And, and I, I, you know, and I personally benefited quite a bit from talking with the ranchers that have been around since the 50s and, and, and been operating those. So, you know, time short, make sure and take that opportunity to listen to what they've said and what they've adapted to. And, and I think there's a, there's a wealth of knowledge there, too. So uh, with that. I'd be happy to, to answer any questions, and I hope I kept us on time, Bronson. <laughs> any questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.